Welcome to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio Live, where we offer the news, information, traffic, weather, sports, and entertainment our commercial drivers want and need. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. History is one of the topics we love to cover. The History of American Holidays by author Jeff Bench celebrates America's history, culture, and patriotism with thought-provoking stories of the most popular holidays Americans celebrate. Jeff's been a regular guest on my show, and he's back with us to discuss the history of Thanksgiving. He's always such a wealth of information. Welcome back, Jeff. It's great to have you on the show. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you, Shelley. I, I appreciate it. You know, and this is such an appropriate topic with Turkey Day coming up. Oh, yes. And Thanksgiving is uh, one of my favorite holidays. I love talking about Thanksgiving because it it represents everything that's right in America. You know, it the really country. does. And it's more than just turkey and cranberry sauce. Oh, definitely. Uh, there's a lot to it. Um, you know, it's about coming together and uh, forgiveness and gratitude. You know, the history of Thanksgiving, uh, from my view of the history, uh, is probably a lot different than most people's. And so I'm, uh, I like getting into it a little bit um, because uh, it is more about gratitude and coming together than uh, celebrating, you know, a, a bountiful harvest and all of that kind of stuff. So, How did it start? Yeah, you, you know, the images we have from, you know, elementary school of the pilgrims and the Native Americans sharing a feast, you know, that's largely folklore. And uh, it, I'm sure, you know, there might be some truth to it. And I'm sure in the colonies, they had their days of Thanksgiving. And uh, even like uh, during the Revolutionary War, uh, George Washington would declare a day of Thanksgiving after a battle or something like that. And, and, and some, some of those types of days of Thanksgiving also occurred during the civil war, but the, the real founder of the Thanksgiving that we know today is this, uh, a woman, uh, Ms. Sarah Josepha Hale and Sarah Hale wrote a book in 1827 uh, called Northwood, a, a Tale of New England. And in that novel, she devoted a whole chapter to uh, occurrences on Thanksgiving Day. And she described the Thanksgiving meal in great detail. And it is the meal that we still cook today, you know, largely with the, the turkey as the center point and all the side dishes and the desserts. Um, but Miss Hale was... Uh, kind of a remarkable woman. She's sort of a combination of like Martha Stewart and Oprah Winfrey in that she uh, she had founded a ladies magazine. That was the title of it. And then she was uh, bought out by uh, this other guy and it became called the Gotti's Ladies Book, which is basically a magazine. And she was the editor of that for over 40 years uh, and, and generated an office audience of 150,000 people or more. So she had a lot of readers and she was quite influential. She was also a, a widow and was raising her five children. And that's why she started writing and created the magazine because she needed to uh, generate some income. She wrote the song, Mary Had a Little Lamb. Oh, and, wow. Okay. <laughs> and and she was big in the anti-slavery and the women's suffrage movements. Mm -hmm. uh, but through all this uh, 40 years of, you know, at, um, you know, magazine publishing and all that, she uh, she saw the political divide between the North and the South throughout the 1800s. And she wanted a holiday, a national holiday that would bring Americans together. And she came up with the idea of Thanksgiving and um, and lobbied five different presidents with letters and trying to get them to declare a national holiday and uh, approximately 30 states were on board and they had Thanksgiving holidays. And then it was finally President Lincoln who responded to one of her letters and declared uh, Thanksgiving a holiday in 1863. Okay. So, and he, he had it as the last Thursday in November, but it was, it was later changed to the fourth Thursday in November uh, largely to help out the uh, commercial uh, 
sales, you know, because if you had it the last Thursday of November, there were certain years where the uh, Christmas shopping season was shortened too much. And so the retail folks wanted it to be consistently a little bit longer. So they came up with the fourth Thursday uh -huh. in November. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I always wondered if it had something to do with that because you've got the big uh, push for Black Friday and, uh, well, of course, today. Uh, going yeah. shopping right after Thanksgiving dinner, they're out there and they're shopping for all of the specials. And... Yeah, I do know some friends who back in the day where the stores would not open until the 26th. So they would, after Thanksgiving dinner, go and, uh, you know, camp out at the store, at, you know, their favorite store. So they could be the first ones yeah. through the store opened at midnight. <laughs> that's some serious shopping yeah <laughs> now i admit i have gone at four o'clock in the morning before i've done it once <laughs> yeah. you know and got some good deals but it's like wow this is just really insane four in the morning <laughs> what am i doing yeah. <laughs> it's all about the experience though right it's just yeah. kind of a fun thing to do something you do at least once and say you did it yeah <laughs> <laughs> have you yeah. done it jeff no, I've never done that, but I've mm -hmm. done other kind of crazy things for my own experiences, like getting up super early in the morning to go do the things I like to do, you know, skiing or whatever, mm -hmm. um, but uh, where people think I'm crazy. But uh, yeah, so I can definitely relate to someone who gets up and grabs a cup of coffee and goes out at four in the morning. I can <laughs> totally relate. <laughs> Sarah. Get a TV for 50 bucks. What the heck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Thanksgiving has been, as many of the holidays, commercialized. And that's why it's really so important to really know how it originated. And I'm I'm fascinated with the woman who came up with the idea and really rallied for getting this as a unification day. Yeah, it is so important for Americans, I think, because... Uh, you know, we all have different backgrounds, we, a lot of different races in America, religious beliefs and, you know, other concerns. But Thanksgiving really brings us together mm -hmm. and uh, under a common sense of gratitude or whatever. Um, so I kind of think, you know, you know, we can disagree in America on just about everything or anything. But Ms. Hale, I think, was right. We can all come together on Thanksgiving. And, I don't see anyone arguing about that. Um, so uh, it's a great uh, unifier. Holidays in general are great unifiers. Uh, I think we've talked about that, whether it's uh, the, you know, the family gatherings on different holidays, the community parades, bringing together uh, larger groups um, or other traditions throughout the states or the, the, the country. And mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, I think, has a special place uh, with all of that, you know, we have an abundance of gratitude on Thanksgiving and it brings together what I kind of call the four F's of Thanksgiving or family, friends, food, and football. They all oh, come yes. <laughs> <laughs> I remember as a kid, my dad had to be watching his football after dinner. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the, the first football game, uh, on Thanksgiving day was in 1876. It was only, 13 years after um, Lincoln proclaimed it a national holiday, we had a first football game on Thanksgiving and that. Really? Yeah. So <laughs> it started early. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah. And the tradition grew quickly and pretty soon high school teams were playing on Thanksgiving and there are like 5,000 games across the country taking place on Thanksgiving and then the, the NFL kind of took it over in 1934 during the depression, the Detroit lions played the Chicago bears and, uh, and the Detroit lions are still playing every year on Thanksgiving. They so. are, they don't always win, but they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's your home team, right? Um, in Michigan. It, yes. Um, but they're, they're, um, the record hasn't been terrific. <laughs> <laughs> but people are still loyal. <laughs> yeah, um, that's true. I, you know, the sport teams I work root for have, uh, they come and go with their good, good years and mostly they're bad. So, uh, 
but it's always fun. And the Thanksgiving football is a big part of the tradition nowadays. It truly is. Football and turkey go together. Jeff, you've got some fascinating history about Thanksgiving as we approach Turkey Day, but we do have to go to break here. You're listening to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio.live. Stay tuned for more. We're going to be back with more on Thanksgiving. The trucking industry keeps America running thanks to the 3.36 million professional truck drivers who deliver everyday goods to 80% of American communities who rely on trucking for that last mile. The industry represents a diverse group with nearly half of drivers at 42% as minorities. Trucking Moves America Forward, or TMAF, educates the public on the essentiality of trucking by telling the story of trucking and its positive impact on our economy, communities, and lives. Learn how you can join the industry movement by visiting truckingmovesamerica.com. Living life on the road can be exhausting. It's not uncommon for truckers to live inside their truck more than their own home. Other than the essential clothing, hygiene, and sleeping items, here are some items every truck driver needs to make life on the road more pleasant and feel more like home. A seat cushion. Comfort is key when driving for 11 hours each day. Having a seat cushion can help with tailbone and back pain. It's also great for boosting overall mood while driving. A portable stove. Investing in a portable stove is a great way to start eating your favorite meals on the road. Eating the same fast food and gas station food gets old really quick. Before buying a portable cooker, you need to invest in a power inverter. A power inverter allows you to use your vehicle's battery to generate AC that can run many types of electrical devices. Car mount. Having a place to mount your cell phone or GPS can be extremely convenient and much safer for truck drivers. Coffee maker. There's nothing quite like a fresh cup of coffee in the morning. Staying awake and alert is crucial for truck drivers. Dash cam. A dash cam is a must-have gadget for your expensive truck. A high-quality dash cam can save you from many problems while traveling on the road. A cooler. Having a cooler on the road can save time and money. It also provides the option for truckers to eat healthier meals. This info blog was brought to you by the Truckers Network. They link truckers and trucking businesses throughout the United States. Their mission is to find the best quality trucking resources in the industry and make the life of a driver easier with quick and easy access to trucking resources. You can find them at app.thetruckersnetwork.net. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio. Live. I'm Shelley Johnson, and I'm talking with Jeff Bench, historian and author of The History of American Holidays. We're talking about Thanksgiving and its history in the United States. Jeff, in our previous segment, you were explaining how football is really a traditional part of Thanksgiving, but the annual feast represents more than that, doesn't it? It really is the miracle of the American bounty. When you think how the annual feast has evolved today from what it used to be years ago. I always think about that first football game during the Great Depression. And, you know, in addition to the food we eat uh, during the Depression, people could spend, you know, like uh, 20% of their monthly income on the Thanksgiving Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, yes. And uh, you think of that, it's sometimes, you know, another way to look at it is equal to a month's uh, rent on... uh, on your dinner and you just think about spending that much money today, it would be unheard of. I mean, rent and house payments today are maybe a thousand or a couple thousand or more dollars. You could get a lot of turkeys for that amount of money today. Sure. Um, So I always, I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but I'm always amazed when I walk into a grocery store Mm -hmm. and I think about all this food is right there. And I, I can pretty much afford anything I want at the grocery store. It, it arrives fresh, safe, and affordable. And uh, mm-hmm. so, so sometimes I think about um, how does this happen? And uh, I did a little research into it and put my own thoughts to it. And if you ask me, it, it began and be, it begins with education. And then 1862, again, President Lincoln and Congress passed the Land-Grant College Act. And uh, there are a lot of land-grant colleges and universities out there today. But um, 
in fact, you know, pretty much any state school, school like Michigan State, Oklahoma State, Oregon State, and even some of the other ones like Cal Berkeley, Cornell, MIT, these were all land grant colleges. And they were set up to uh, study agriculture and mechanics, and like Texas A and M, uh, okay. for instance. Yeah. Um, and mechanics is basically engineering, and uh, so they set it up where the, the federal government would donate a bunch of land, and then the, the university could sell off parts of it and and keep parts, and the uh, the money from the land sale could go to build the college. And uh, so all these colleges were set up to basically study agriculture and they're, they're across the country. So each uh, college could uh, study the climate and the soils and the unique ecosystems to their specific area, but yet they could all share ideas. Um, and, you know, one of the earliest uh, graduates from a land grant college was this guy, uh, George Washington Carver. And I don't know if many people know even know who he is, but he's he's an amazing guy. He oh was, yeah, he, he was born a slave in 1864, and uh, his family was stolen. And I kind of get a kick out of that, and gives me something to think about because I've heard of people getting kidnapped, but back then, you know, he was property and he was stolen. That that just really struck me. But but he was stolen by slave raiders when he was an infant, and, and George and his brother were recovered by his original owner, but his mother and sister were never recovered. Oh, wow. Yeah. And as a small boy, he was kind of a sickly child, and he tended to household chores, and so he was taught to read and write by the women of the house. Mm -hmm. And then he left home at age 11 to pursue his education, and he kind of bounced around and, but he ultimately graduated from high school, and then he found his way to the very first land grant college, which was Iowa State. And there he studied agriculture, and he graduated in 1894 with a, a degree in a bachelor's degree, and then uh, in 1896 with a master's of science. And so from there, he went to Tuskegee uh, University, a land grant college in Alabama, and he was a professor for many years, but he pioneered crop rotation science mm -hmm. uh, kind of during a period when most Southern farmers weren't ready to listen to a college kid. But the farmers are, were really impressed with his methods of rotating crops between cotton and sweet potatoes and soybeans. And he became an agricultural legend. And then with that, uh, during this time period, there's an overabundance of crop production and he he developed alternative uses for foods like oils and flowers and cosmetics, uh, you know, stains, dyes, inks, soaps, uh, just to name a few. So he spent the rest of his life there. And then following his death in 1943, uh, President Roosevelt established a national monument at Carver's childhood home. And he was a uh, the first non-president to have a national monument in his honor. Wow. Yeah. So he was a genius, really. And when you think about it, the crop rotation and proper use of the land, uh, the Dust Bowl in Kansas, even in the 1930s, a lot of that was because people weren't growing things correctly and all the topsoil blew off during the drought. Uh, mm. they, they really had to rethink agriculture and they should have listened to him. <laughs> yeah yeah it, you're right you, um we're always learning and um and that's sort of the the great thing about this um you mentioned the the, the dust bowl era mm -hmm. um the next great uh you know well let's just call it innovation in in agriculture was water supply yeah. uh, this guy john wesley powell you may have heard powell reservoir but he was one of the first guys to uh, map and run the Colorado River when it was wild in the mid 1800s, and but he was a geologist and a, a engineer, and he uh, he eventually uh, became uh, I guess director of the uh, United States Geologic Survey, the USGS, and his 
first thing was he recognized that as you move west, it became more arid. And he was at the time up against the manifest destiny kind of thinking that was prevalent in the United States, which was that we had this God given a duty to move westward and uh, take over the land and all that kind of stuff. But a lot of these uh, uh, manifest destiny type believers and a lot of politicians preach that God would provide water where needed and that basically water follows the plow. And uh, that didn't work out too well. <laughs> you know, a lot of farmers starved and froze to death on the you know the plains of Wyoming and uh, the Dakotas. And so then Congress finally started listening to Mr. Powell. And in the late 1800s, he was mapping uh, most of the uh, Western United States because he, he knew that you needed maps to figure out which way the water flowed. So once you had that figured out, then you could start building dams and canals and things like that. Sure. Yeah. And then 1902, you had the Bureau of Reclamation really starting to build those uh, dams, reservoirs, canals, and other infrastructure. And the, the federal government um, originally uh, thought the farmers would pay off the loans uh, for all that uh, infrastructure that the you know, the Bureau of Reclamation was building. Uh, you know, they'd farm, they'd sell the crops, they'd have money left over, they'd pay off the loans. But that didn't work too well because, uh, you know, they could grow so many crops that uh, it would drive the price down, as our economic system tends to do. Yep. Supply and demand. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so uh, they first forgave the principal and said, hey, why don't you farmers just pay back uh, interest only, and uh, maybe we'll stretch the loans out to a longer time period. Well, eventually, that didn't work either. So then, the federal government just, you know, basically forgave the loans, and uh, so we still have all this great infrastructure in place, and uh, federal government runs it, uh, and it it goes to uh, helping us uh, water crops and grow a lot of great food, and still be able to afford it at the grocery store. Um, so it but, sounds like groceries today, even though we've had a major spike in pricing, they were more expensive in the 1930s, weren't they? In terms of your percent of income, mm -hmm. uh, most definitely. Yeah. And, and then also uh, what you received, you know, uh, it wasn't nicely packaged and easy to cook and all that kind of stuff. Sure. And, uh, yeah. Uh, it took a lot of labor to get from the grocery store to the kitchen table. There's a lot more labor in between. Mm -hmm. I know milk was a very expensive product. People often had uh, powdered milk, didn't they? And, and made their own from that? Um, yeah, I kind of uh, haven't really done much research on that. Uh, you know, what I know is, uh, I remember just as a kid, we all had a milk box in our front and we'd have a oh, milk sure. pan deliver yeah, the milk milkman yeah yeah so um and then i remember growing up it was a big deal when the uh gas stations started selling milk <laughs> oh yeah sure but how convenient and what somebody was brilliant with that you know yeah yeah because what do you always forget what are you out of a milk and you don't want to go to the grocery store grab a gallon while you're getting gas in your car yeah yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. So I do find it interesting how um, the federal government did forgive the loans to the farmers. And uh, we see this all all over the time with the federal government, you know, bailing out various industries, mm -hmm. you know, from farmers to railroads, airlines, uh, auto manufacturers, even the banking and financial institutions. So uh, it's a common thing. And it, it's uh, and usually works out to be a good thing. Uh, in otherwise, the long run. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, an industry or whatever doesn't have to start over again from ground zero as they're going through an economic downturn. Sure. Yeah. And, and certainly with agriculture, Mother Nature is, is very unpredictable. And years and years ago, they didn't have the accuracy they have uh, or the countermeasures that they could take to keep those crops going. If you had some sort of blight, 
they didn't have ways to deal with that either. There are always uh, variables when it comes to farming, even today. So it is miraculous that things are more affordable on our table, on our kitchen table. We have to go to break, Jeff. I want to talk some more about Thanksgiving, the food, the history. There's so much information here. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio Live. We're talking with Jeff Bench, author and historian, and we're talking about Thanksgiving. Stay tuned. TNC Radio. Live is proud to carry the Steve Summers Overnight Drive Show. TNC Radio. Live is dedicated to commercial drivers. We offer the news, traffic, and weather you need, and the entertainment, sports, talk, music, and celebrity interviews you want to hear 24 7. We have original shows and trucker podcasts that feature some of your favorites, like Ice Road Alex Demogorski and America's Truck and Sweetheart Marcia Campbell. TNC Radio. Live is convenient and designed for professional drivers. The best part is we're free, and you can listen anywhere you are on the road. With just one tap, you can tune into Steve Summers and us right on your phone. Simply download our app by going to app.tncradio.live. That's app.tncradio.live. Welcome back to the Truckers Network Radio Show on TNC Radio. Live. I'm Shelley Johnson, and I'm talking with Jeff Bench, historian and author of The History of American Holidays. We're talking about Thanksgiving, some really interesting facts. How did the fare that we're used to eating, the turkey, the cranberry, the dressing, do you have information on that and how that all evolved for the meal? Well, it was... Primarily uh, Sarah Hale in okay. her in the, that book, uh, uh, you know, Northwood and New England uh, story or whatever it was, the tale of New England. Mm-hmm. Um, in that book, she described all of that in, in sort of great detail, but, you know, a couple paragraphs anyway. Um, and uh, it just grew from there. But she, she mentions turkey with stuffing and uh, uh, a lot of the other uh, kind of foods we eat. Um, so, uh, but yeah, the uh, our food supply, it, it is amazing. And uh, the next thing that kind of came along, though, we got the, the colleges, the science, the water supply, and then there is electricity to the farms that really boosted uh, agricultural production. It was like in the 1930s, only 3% of rural homes had electricity. And then, uh, you know, uh, the cities had it because they had a, a consumer base that could pay the rates sure. that would pay for the wires or whatever, the power lines. But to run a power line out to a small town or even to an individual farm, mm-hmm. uh, you couldn't recover that cost Very with, true. with their rates. And so the federal government stepped up again with the Rural Electrification Act of 1936. Mm-hmm. And this government spending worked out really well because it gets us out of the depression. It, one of the things that got us out of the depression and it, it invests in America's future, of course. And the, the federal government provided loans to electric companies. And then they also provided engineering and crews to install the electrical distribution lines and home and uh, farm wiring system. Uh, so that that really fueled the economy after World War II. Mm-hmm. And by 1959, over 90% of the rural homes had electricity. Which was phenomenal. I can share a story. There was a family farm that we had, and it was right after World War II. Prior to World War II, the particular farm that had been purchased for everybody to farm it, it had a windmill and that's how you got your water which is terrific when the wind blows and (laughs) and and the way the the farmer who had actually built the farmhouse had designed it he actually had a holding tank on the second floor so it was gravity fed there was water and you had water for your tub and your kitchen sink and your toilet Mm -hmm. but if the wind doesn't blow then you've got a problem there was a light plant so you had uh, lights but you had an ice box because there was not enough to 
power a refrigerator. And it wasn't until after World War II that electrical lines were actually brought past that farm. So what you're saying is absolutely true. <laughs> Farmers really had it tough. <laughs> yeah. Primitive. Yeah. Yeah. When you think back on that, um, exactly. The refrigerator, you, you know, the ice box keeping your milk cold and um, even all your uh, everything you grow and produce, mm -hmm. uh, keeping it from spoiling. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. It, and if, it is interesting that uh, how we can figure out how to afford to do all of that stuff. And even today, you know, there's there's things that, uh, you, you know, like, in, you know, like Internet broadband kind of connections to rural communities and to um, other types of disadvantaged communities. You know, uh, it takes effort, you know, uh, for uh, a, sort of a community, almost uh, social type of federal effort to get these things in place. Mm -hmm. and we we tend to forget it how it, how it happens once it's there. Um, sure, out like of sight, out of mind. Yep. Yeah. Um, you know, and the next thing uh, that really helped increase our agriculture industry was uh, the interstate highway system. Yeah. Um, it was originally in the 1950s developed as a national defense readiness system, so we could move things around if we were ever attacked. And, but it has turned into uh, a great transportation of of everything, but including food supplies and machinery and, and getting mm -hmm. products from the, the fields to the uh, distribution places to the uh, um, manufacturing and uh, production areas into the grocery stores. And I know our audience, the uh, truck drivers, uh, they can definitely appreciate that. that mm -hmm. uh, the value that, of the interstates. That was the major growth in the trucking industry at that time. Oh, I bet it gave them the the means to get get around quickly. Um, and and I'm sure, you know, the, our truckers today, uh, you know, I'm sure they pay their fair share of taxes to keep the roads in good condition. But mm -hmm. um, it, it, it did take this sort of federal, it was a defense idea at the time, but the, the federal government really came up and uh, hit a, basically hit a home run on that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the trucking industry played a major role in the growth of all of that, too. It, it oh. was a, a symbiotic relationship. Trucking is really what made our country grow as much as it did, I think, from World War II on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it makes uh, total sense to me. I uh, I know we've talked a little bit offline and I worked a summer sort of in the trucking industry and uh, um, I just always admire those guys. They're kind of like the cowboys of modern era. They know? really are. Yep. Yeah. They get to see the, the country and I love I love a good road trip as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So <laughs> and, and uh, we know how, how dependent we are on it as well because if the products aren't moving uh everybody's hurting pretty quickly everything comes to a stop yeah <laughs> within days it doesn't take long yeah i've never really thought about that how quickly it could uh have a dramatic effect mm -hmm. we really yeah. can and, and you know it isn't just trucking you've got rail there are a lot of different types of ways that goods are shipped from point a to point b and if one cog in that wheel gets stuck, you got problems. It, it is just so true. And that's why the, I find the grocery store so amazing <laughs> that yeah. every day it's full of food. And every day people are working all over the place throughout the whole uh, supply chain. They would hear a lot about supply chain these days mm -hmm. and and how amazing it is. Um, it and really is. Yeah. It's a science in and of itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The optimization of moving uh, anything from point A to point B, mm -hmm. you know, just uh, there's a certain amount of thinking that can goes into it because, you, you know, you don't want to drive anywhere empty. So if you can uh, empty a load and pick up a load and take it back, all that kind of stuff, uh, how that gets thought through is pretty amazing. I yeah. had a quick question I had read that Benjamin Franklin wanted to make the turkey the official bird of the United States. 
And of course, we all decided, I guess someone decided, I don't know who, on the bald eagle. If the turkey had been made the official bird, that wouldn't be on our tables on Thanksgiving, would it? <laughs> yeah. Sarah Hale may, may have had a different idea then. Who knows? It might have been the, the chicken or a rack of lamb or something like that. I don't know. But, <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah. Benjamin Franklin, I don't know why he thought the turkey was so neat, but I think that there were a lot more turkeys than bald eagles at the time um, in our country. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I agree. I'd, I've heard that before, and I don't know exactly who... Um, you know, basically said, "No, nah, let's go with the let's go with the bald eagle." The eagle is obviously more majestic and oh, yes. uh, a stronger presence. Uh, the turkey is, uh, uh, you know, doesn't have a great appearance as being the most intelligent animal. When you, oh, they're not. My grandmother <laughs> used to raise turkeys. They're not smart at all. No. Mm -mm. Yeah, <laughs> I've heard stories. <laughs> we have wild turkeys in our neighborhood and every once in a while you, you can see one you know kind of running down the the, the neighborhood street and uh, mm -hmm. it's a little comical it is <laughs> um wild turkeys actually have more dark meat the domesticated turkeys are bred for white meat and of course i think the domesticated turkeys just by nature of being domesticated they don't have their wild instincts I remember yeah. the first time I ever saw a turkey in a tree, a wild turkey that could fly. That was amazing. Well, they do fly, but not when they're, you know, going to be on your dining room table for Thanksgiving. They're too heavy to fly at that point. But yeah. Right. We see them fly out of our backyard every once in a while and they cannot fly very far and they don't get very high. But it is kind of fun to to see because they're a pretty big bird, you know, they are. And, and to get that weight up in flight. You know, you can hear the wings flapping and uh, mm -hmm. you wonder if they're going to make it to the tree, you know. <laughs> it's gonna... sure, sure. Yeah, you don't want to be in their flight path. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you mentioned the dark meat, you know, the, the goose is another good uh, holiday tradition. Um, sometimes uh, I'll cook a goose at Christmas mm -hmm. and it's usually 100 percent dark meat and yep. it's pretty, pretty oily and I love it, but. Um, not many other people do. You know, so it, I always have to kind of, all right, if you're cooking a goose, we're cooking something else um, kind of thing. But uh, I think the, uh, the uh, again, part of the science and uh, of our agricultural industry, I think the, the turkeys today are bred uh, specifically, you know, for that large uh, breast meat, the white breast meat. So yeah. I don't think it's a, uh, any sort of accident. Um, that, no, uh, it, it was a preference somehow in the nation. People preferred that. I personally like the dark meat. So, yeah. and most of my family growing up like the dark meat. When you have a, a turkey like that, those are the legs. That's it. So, I mean, whoever gets the leg first <laughs> gets yeah. the dark meat. Other than that, it's white meat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think we're on the same page there. Um, I was the one who took the dark meat. No one else wanted it. Not on our table. There is usually a squabble until mom stepped in. <laughs> That's where the wishbone comes in, right? Anyway, we have to go to break here, Jeff. You're listening to the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio Live. We're talking about Thanksgiving. Stay tuned for more coming up. Great leaders challenge their people not to stop at the first right answer. Tighten the Lug Nuts is the book that will help you move past that first right answer to be more effective, more productive, and more successful. This book serves as a blueprint that can be easily applied by leaders, entrepreneurs, truckers, owner-operators, all of us in our everyday lives. This is one of the best leadership books you can read to help you accelerate towards your personal and professional goals. Plus, a portion of the proceeds will be donated to truckerschristmasgroup.org. Visit tightenthelugnuts.com to order your copy today. Welcome back to the Truckers Network radio show on TNC Radio Live. I'm Shelley Johnson, and I'm talking with historian and author Jeff Bench. We're talking about the history of Thanksgiving and all the fixings. With the holiday coming up, it's appropriate. Jeff, you were talking about the evolution of our agriculture. There's been quite the history and evolution of how everything has come from farm to table to make the Thanksgiving dinner so affordable. Another interesting thing about our our food industry and how it 
came, you know, to be so uh, abundant was uh, following World War II, there was the Cold War. And we had to, uh, uh, you know, us and the Russians were sort of battling, you know, obviously in a, uh, in a peaceful way, but uh, we needed to kind of validate and preserve our economic and political system. And to, to do that, we had to show that it was better and, and having more food was one of the ways. So some will say that that's one of the reasons the federal government was quick to invest in all of these things. Uh, but to, so they could win this sort of food war. Mm-hmm. And uh, at the same time, you know, America was willing to share our knowledge of crop production. And uh, Russian leader Nikita Khrushchev visited Iowa Farms in 1959. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of a historic event. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, the science and technology of the American farm really didn't translate to Russia because he kind of went back there and said, here, you know, we're going to grow corn in Siberia. We got plenty of room up there, but he didn't really think about the soil type, the, the, uh, you know, the uh, climate and all of that. So they had a lot of growing pains and it, it just kind of showed that, you know, our, you know, diverse, you know, social de- democracy, uh, government investment, and then capital production uh, was way more successful than sort of the authoritative communism that they had in russia yes absolutely Uh, so like i said it's everything that's uh right about america kind of gets celebrated at thanksgiving is sort of my way of looking at it (laughs) well we are we have states that are called the bread basket and in certainly you're in california california is responsible for a lot of our produce and you have a lot of shipments that you stock many departments in the grocery stores across the country yeah, we do. Um, and that's, you know, I grew up in southern Minnesota and, you know, so I know a lot about uh, corn and soybean farming and wheat. Mm-hmm. You get to California and uh, uh, we have the Central Valley and it's, it's you know, irrigated from the what we store in the mountains. And we have this two tremendous water systems throughout California that deliver irrigation water. And uh, um, they grow everything from garlic to tomatoes to fruits and vegetables, you know, a lot of orchards uh, as you drive down the highway. So um, I forget the percentages, but a, a tremendous percent of all fruits and vegetables it, are grown in uh, California. Wasn't that California really had a growth spurt in agriculture in the 30s after the during the Dust Bowl, people from Kansas and all over went to California because they were farmers and they wanted to be able to farm or work on farms. Wasn't that how California got a real boost in terms of population and growth? Um, yeah, that that was one of the the, the uh, things that helped motivate a lot of people left from you know Oklahoma area and stuff to uh, uh, California. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Steinbeck has a book. I'm drawing a blank on. Is that the, the grapes, grapes of wrath? Of wrath yes, yeah. I read it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, if you get into the, sort of the California ag history, it, it is pretty interesting in itself because uh, a lot of uh, uh, people from Mexico migrated up to work the fields and they yeah. still do today. They sure. uh, labor camps uh, throughout the state, uh, you know, um, where they'll house the farm laborers so they can uh, work the fields. And, mm-hmm. um it's a it's an important thing. It's an interesting history there too. It's more of a Labor Day topic, but it's sure. it, it's interesting. Uh, it's shaped our food, and in certainly how bountiful it is, and not super expensive. The affordability of our products here in the United States, which makes Thanksgiving a possibility. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've really grown the agricultural industry. Uh, you know, tremendously. And like I mentioned, California, we have just a tremendous, uh, you know, water delivery systems and, and all of that. And it's interesting, you know, the, the food industry, you know, it, it, it's, uh, it's so amazing, but it does come with certain costs and we're always trying to improve things. I think uh, you can go back to the 1970s. There's this George McGovern nutritional study uh, People didn't pay attention to it. And, you know, uh, 
the you know the food production folks uh, lo lobbied Congress, and uh, so our nutritional model hasn't been the greatest. And we did create a society that's a little on the obese side with expensive health issues. And the environment suffers a little bit with soil erosion, fertilizers, and uh, other chemicals. Uh, but, you know, then at the same time, we've talked about it. We advance. America recognizes their problems, you know, it's, and uh, makes and develops solutions. You know, we've got climate change in front of us now. But, uh, you know, sometimes it just takes longer to sort of recognize and address or recognize the problems. Um I think I like smoking and seat belts and things of that nature, but eventually we figure it out and we we're able to move forward with new solutions. So, uh, you know, I'm just always thankful for that as well. America's innovation for sure. We mm -hmm. have just a couple minutes left here, Jeff. Did you have a, a summary about Thanksgiving? And, and certainly I want people to know where they can find your book. It's a tremendous book. Oh, in summary, I would just say it's gratitude. Thanksgiving's all about gratitude and the grocery store is a, a great place to start. But, you know, if you want to improve your happiness and there's the one single thing you can do is be grateful about something every day. And, uh, you know, if you can tap into your gratitude, you'll, you'll never have a bad day. And Thanksgiving allows us to do that, you know, um, it's all about being thankful and, you know, we can remember or we can kind of overlook our daily struggles and, uh, you know, our empathy for others who go without, you know, we can just think about them on Thanksgiving and, uh, and if we can carry that with us every day, um, you'll, you'll just be a lot happier. And then the, the traditions of Thanksgiving, it's just the best way to bring people together and it starts with the family and friends and it kind of goes from there. So uh, wonderful summary. I totally agree. And then uh, in terms of the book, um, yeah, it's available on all the uh, online outlets like Amazon and Barnes and Noble, History of American Holidays. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, taps into uh, just the key points of each holiday and, and how they uh, relate to America and, and what we are today. And then it usually ties into uh, a current current events um, like we did today with uh, um, you know the ag industry and how we have developed such a, a, a wonderful thing together and how we keep it going and um, we still have struggles today and we're kind of helping each other out every day and um, I think that's what uh, holidays are all about. Absolutely yes your book has wonderful perspectives and it really ties things together and makes sense and it's a lot more interesting than the history classes we had in school. I, I love the way you approached all of this. The History of American Holidays by author Jeff Bench. And your last name is spelled B-E-N-S-C-H for those who are looking. So they can definitely find your book. I really appreciate you being on the show, Jeff. This has been terrific. All right. Thank you, Shelley. I, I appreciate it, too. It's, it's always so much fun. And this is a great topic. Thanksgiving. Now I'm ready to go eat some turkey. <laughs> All right. Me too. <laughs> You've been listening to the Truckers Network radio show on TNCRadio.live. I'm your host, Shelley Johnson. I've been talking with author and historian Jeff Bench. He's the author of The History of American Holidays, and we've been talking about Thanksgiving. Definitely check out his book. It's terrific. And stay tuned for more right here on TNCRadio.live. We've got great entertainment and information. Stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another great interview on TNC Radio Live and the Truckers Network Radio Show. All of the material you hear on TNC Radio Live on our website, our broadcasts, or our podcasts are copyrighted. There can be no distribution without the express consent of TNC Radio Live and its partners. For inquiries, write us at info at TNC Radio Live. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast of the Truckers Network Radio Show.